James Hamish Lamley, and I'm a historical leather worker. I take my inspiration from the early history of Scotland, of which I'm going to talk about. We don't have many sources or archaeological artefacts for early medieval Scotland when compared to England or Ireland, and so when we can identify an artefact, it's quite magical to unravel its story and maybe even bring it back to life. Here I'm crafting what I like to call a crannog bag. Crannogs were ancient roundhouses built over water. We've got the remains of around 500 in Scotland and a really good replica on Loch Tay. They appeared as early as the Bronze Age and some were still inhabited in the 18th century until they were destroyed for harbouring rebel Jacobites, would you believe? At a crannog site on Loch Glashan, on the west coast of Scotland, an archaeological dig turned up some leather artefacts. One of them was the remains of what we believe to be a satchel. After studying the original in the museum, I made some interpretations on how I think the bag would have looked. It's a relatively simple design, elegant in a way, made from a single deer skin laced together with strips of hide. After making several plain examples, I then started to embellish my version, pulling inspiration from other sources of the same time period. For this bag, I'm going to emboss it with some knotwork decoration inspired by a Pictish stone in Perthshire. In this way we can pull elements of Scottish history together and reconnect people with what that represents. I like to use historic tools as much as possible in my work. So the knife I'm using here is a head knife and we have an example found at Port Mahomic in the north of Scotland at a Pictish monastery. It's important to use the tools that were being used at the time as it helps you build up a picture of how these items were being made and how much work went into them. I'm not using deer skin like the original bag here. As this is my more contemporary style with different tooling, I'm using cowhide as it will give me a crisper edge on the decoration work. We know the picks were using cowhides as a lot of the leatherworking tools, like the head knife, were found at monastic sites like Port Mahomic with cowhide, which they were often processing for uh, producing vellum. The truth is that not many people know much at all about early Scottish history, or Pictish history for that matter. It's wrapped up in a lot of ambiguity, so I'm going to take you through a brief timeline of Scotland from the 1st century AD to the 10th century. Who were the Picts and where are they now? Our knowledge of Iron Age Scotland first comes from the Romans mainly because they were the ones writing everything down. They invaded southern Britain in 55 BC, but it wasn't until AD 80 that a campaign was launched in the north, what is now Scotland, by Governor Agricola. Around then, Ptolemy produced a map of northern Britain, identifying the native tribes. It identified 16 tribes inhabiting Scotland, such as the Venicones, Tezale, or Caledoni, where we get the early name Caledonia for Scotland. Agricola's campaign didn't last, nor did any that came after, really. Each time the Romans seemed to gain a foothold in Scotland, they eventually had to withdraw again from a fierce native warlike culture, as it just wasn't worth the resources to sustain a campaign. Eventually, Emperor Hadrian began building the famous Hadrian's Wall to keep the natives locked in the north. 
and by the 3rd century, we see the northern tribes had come together into two major tribes, the Caledoni and the Maite. Bigger means stronger, and these tribes could now defend their territory against the Romans. A couple of centuries later, in 297, a Roman document mentioned two foes of Rome, the Hiberni in Ireland and the Picti in Northern Britain. This is the first mention of the Picts, the name possibly meaning the painted people, referring to their body paint or tattooing, which is mentioned in other sources that the barbarians of Northern Britain painted their skin with animals. Later, in 364, the Picts are mentioned in a series of raids in the south, alongside Scots and Saxons. This is also the first mention of Scots. So in this period, they're merely Gaelic speakers from Ireland or the west of Scotland, a land around Argyll that's later known as the Kingdom of Dalreda. And the Saxons were from Germany, as they hadn't yet settled in Britain. By 410, Rome had fully withdrawn from Britain. There wasn't any great victory for the Picts. It was just partly due to the frontier in Caledonia being too costly without much reward, and partly due to the Romans needing their forces elsewhere, so they had to withdraw. So this marks the end of the Iron Age in Scotland, and opens up the early medieval period. One thing I particularly love about the Kranich bag is how economical it is with material. The original maker didn't need to produce sinew, which is what was used for most sewing in that period, which was very time consuming to produce, nor did he have to trade with the sinew maker. Instead, he was using strips cut from the same hide to lace the bag together. This means it takes less time and you need less tools, so it's much faster to produce and it shows a little bit of the thinking behind the craftsmen and how they were working at the time.
slits are punched down the edges of the leather to lace it together. Now the slits on the original bag were all uniform in length, leaving me to believe that a chisel was made to punch these slits rather than them being cut with a knife. This is another little telltale about the economy behind the craft at the time, as not only was the craftsman producing these items, but was having to produce the tools to make these items, or having to commission them from a blacksmith. So this shows a little bit of ingenuity behind the bag or trading going on, and that these different crafts connect together to create one item. I often wonder if they had a workshop dog that liked to help too. There were two parallel rows of slits running across the bag and when we fold these together and lace through them it creates a top ridge on the bag with a flap. There was no strap found with the bag but on the side gussets there were slots punched to indicate exactly where a strap would have been attached. The original bag didn't have any decoration on it, but bags of the same time period found in Ireland are often tooled with knotwork. So I've decided to tool this bag with knotwork from the St. Meadows Pictish Stone in Perthshire, as it adds a nice aesthetic to the bag. I've already drawn the design out, I'm just tracing over it now to transfer it to the leather. So with the vacuum left by the Roman withdrawal, the native tribes could flourish. So we've got a century of British tribes reaching out for more land, strengthening their borders, and nations starting to form. The Picts were included in this, mentioned by Gildas as springing forth from their coracles alongside Scots to raid south into Northumbria, south of Hadrian's Wall. As a result, British tribes in the south brought in Saxon mercenaries to settle and provide a defence against northern attacks. So this was the start of the Saxon migration into Britain, alongside the Angles and Jutes. It was during the 5th century we also see two new kingdoms of Britons in the north, distinct from the Picts. We have the Kingdom of Alt Clut in the Clyde Valley to the west of Scotland, and the Kingdom of Gododin in Lothian in the east. Between these two kingdoms marks the southern boundary of the Picts. So this places Pictish territory in the east of Scotland, around Fife and Perthshire, north along Aberdeen and Murrayshire, and north up into Cate Ness.
by scribing over my design with the leather a little bit damp, I can imprint the design into the leather, ready for tooling. Using antler tools I've carved, I can then start embossing the design into the leather, which is all done by compressing the leather around the design. This is how leather was tooled in the early medieval period, as evidenced on knife sheaths and bags. It's important not to let the leather dry out as you're tooling it, as it has to be quite damp in order to compress properly. In the 5th century, we now have sources referring to the land of the Picts as Pictavia, which means Pictland. This is the first true sign of a Pictish polity forming with defined boundaries. They're speaking a P-Celtic language, similar to Welsh rather than Gaelic, and a distinct art style of carved symbol stones. They had a feudal system under an aristocratic elite ruled by kings, so this is more of what you'd imagine a medieval kingdom to be like with big differences already between the earlier collection of Iron Age tribes dubbed the Pictai and now the early medieval Pictish kingdom that's forming. So what do these Picts look like? Well, the evidence of homesteads we have show Roundhouses, turf longholes, stone villages around earlier brochs, which are stone tower dwellings, and crannogs were still being used. They were dressed very similar to other cultures in the British Isles at the time, with woolen trousers and tunics, and a wool cloak or hood. Leather would have been used for shoes, bags and belts, and the stone carvings show neatly manicured hair and beard styles, and a noble bearing. It's a far cry from the naked barbarian savages that time has painted them like. And we also have finds of intricate jewellery in the form of silver brooches, pins and chains. So this is a sophisticated culture we have, with high-end arts, craft and construction going on. A list of Pictish kings survives in variable copies, and it's also a great source for who reigned when and provides insight into the system of succession. The king list begins in the end of the 5th century and continues into the 9th century. It shows that very few Pictish kings had fathers who were kings, or even Picts for that matter. So it seems the Picts used a matrilineal system, with kingship being passed down through the female line to nephews and brothers, so in this way the kingship wouldn't pass to an unsuitable prince, but there'd be a wider range of candidates. In the 6th century was the first battle between the Picts and the Scots of Dalreda in the year 559. The origins of the Scots, as told by Bede, is that they came from Ireland at the start of the century to found their new kingdom, which is a nice idea of them kind of migrating over. But the archaeological data doesn't actually support this theory and we don't see the new kind of uh, settlements that you'd expect to see. And so it could be that the Scots were a native culture 
already present, as the earlier Roman sources do support. Historically, leather wouldn't have been dyed so much, as the colours would have come in through the tanning process by using different barks to tan the leather. However, as I'm using modern cowhide for this bag that's been tanned with mimosa bark to get that light colour, I need to dye it darker to get that nice aged antique look to it. Now we come to Christianity, as the Picts were the last culture in the British Isles to convert to Christianity. The Northumbrian monk Bede, in his writings, claimed that Christianity first came to the Picts via St Ninian in the south, during the start of the 6th century, and later by St Columba, who came as a missionary to the northern Picts half a century later, in 565. Columba's mission seemed to have the most success, starting with informing his own monastery on Iona, which is on the west coast of Scotland, under the supervision of the kings of Dalreda. And from here he made forays into northern Pictavia, and was eventually given permission for his monks to preach. By the 7th century, Pictavia was a Christian kingdom, under the spiritual authority of the abbot of Iona. So this seemed to ease the tension between the Picts and the Scots, as they were now connected by their religion. And I think this would have also been the start of the Gallic language spreading into Pictavia through the clergy, as all sermons would have been given in Gallic. We now have to look at this new religion, not just being about faith, but that it connected Pictavia to the wider world in terms of language and trade through the church. One of the most known events from the 7th century is the conquest of Gododin which survives in a Welsh poem and the Irish Annals. This was an attack of the Four of Aden, now Edinburgh, by King Oswald of Northumbria, expanding his kingdom northwards. Now, the Picts had little love for Gododin, but with them gone, Northumbria was now directly on the southern border of Pictavia, and just a couple of decades later, pushed north again to take Stirlingshire. Now, although Pictavia was within the Christian fold, 
The Synod of Whitby in 664 showed that there were still strong divisions between kingdoms. So this was a gathering of churchmen in Northumbria. They were discussing the differences between the Celtic and the Roman traditions in the church. King Oswu of Northumbria had spent his youth exiled in Dalreda, so he was used to the Celtic traditions, which were also upheld across most of Northumbria anyway, whereas the southern Saxons upheld the Roman tradition under the Archbishop of Canterbury. The Celtic traditions still acknowledged the authority of the Pope in Rome, but they had some outdated customs which included calculating the date of Easter and, for some reason, the way the monks would tonsure their hair. So after a bickering match at the Synod, King Oswu put his support behind the Roman traditions. So we've got Northumbria pushing on the border of Bactavia, and now their religious practices were at odds, which was just another divide between the two kingdoms. end of the 7th century saw a war between Pictish King Brood and Northumbrian King Egfrith. They fought at the Battle of Dunnekin in 685 and the Picts scored a victory and killed Egfrith and his bodyguard. I like the mention of this battle as the Pictish cross slab at Aberlemno has this battle carved on it in quite great detail where we can actually see the Northumbrians running from the Picts in defeat and it shows a lot of the detail in the arms and armour and the, the ranks of the Picts and the way they were fighting. So it's a really interesting stone to look at and tells a really great story of the battle. Moving into the 8th century, we have Nectin, king of Bactavia, adopting the Roman tradition across the kingdom, which brought some peace between Bactavia and Northumbria again. So this is where we see the elaborate carved Pictish stones appearing, with crosses on one side and symbols on the other, uh, possibly with help from Northumbrian stone carvers sent north, as there's a lot of similarities between these Pictish stones and the ones in Northumbria. However, these changes didn't go down well with everyone in Bactavia. Some of the veterans had been fighting in battles against Northumbria for decades and didn't like giving up their Celtic traditions. So, Bactavia went mental as lesser kings fought to dethrone Necton and fight amongst themselves for the crown. After years of fighting, a new king came around called Angus, son of Fergus. Now, Angus was a warlord, and after his son was taken captive for ransom, he invaded Dalreda, and his invasion sacked some major fortresses and forced Dalreda to pay homage to him as overking of the Picts and the Scots. So this is one of the first big steps in culture crossover, as the two are, I wouldn't say united, but they are forced together under one overking. Then of course we have Vikings. So the first Viking raids in Britain were against the Northumbrian monastery at Lindisfarne in 793. But a couple of years later, the monastery on Iona was raided several times with a brutal massacre in 806. So with Viking raids against the coast of Dalreda creating chaos, Pictish King Constantine was able to set his son Domno as over King of the Scots, and he was maybe providing extra manpower for defence against the Viking raids in the west. After decades of Viking raids, the Scots and Picts united an army to destroy the Viking raiders, but were sadly defeated, and both kings, Ewan of Bactavia and Aed of Dalreda, were slain. It was this defeat that led to chaos within the kingdoms again, until eventually a new king managed to step up. And that was Kenneth MacAlpin, who succeeded Aed as king of Dalreda. 
Now, Kenneth's origins are steeped in mystery, so we can't say for certain whether he was a Scot or a Pict, but his authority was recognised in a kingdom that needed a new monarch. Kenneth MacAlpin's death in 858 was noted in the Irish Annals, which described him as Rex Pictorum, King of the Picts. At some point in his reign, then, he was able to unify the Scots and the Picts under one monarch. A 12th century Welsh source explains this by Kenneth marching east and conquering Pictavia, but later historians have refuted this. Instead, it's interpreted that Kenneth put himself forward as a legitimate candidate for the Pictish throne. With the previous half century bearing strong ties between Pictavia and Darrera, it's possible he was of Pictish descent through his mother's side, and so he was accepted by both kingdoms. The bag now gets wax for protection using an ancient recipe of beeswax, tallow, and needs for oil. For centuries, Pictavia had already been influenced by the Gallic Church, and for decades the bond between Pictavia and Alreda, menaced by Viking raiders, had seen more crossover in language and culture, as many Scots uh, may have fled into Pictavia. So Kenneth MacAlpin is the king known for paving the foundations for the Kingdom of Scotland, but it was actually after his reign that the kingdom became known as Alba and kings were no longer referred to as Rex Pictorum, but Re Alban, King of Alba. After Kenneth's reign, Northern Britain was plagued by Norse and Danish warbands for years. Alcluck suffered the most, and eventually shifted its power north to govern in what is now Glasgow, and is then known as the Kingdom of Strathclyde. The Pictish Kingdom is restored in the beginning of the 10th century though, as King Constantine II defeated the Norsemen in 904 in Strathurn. So this is the last mention of Picts, as the kingdom becomes Alba, and eventually evolves to become part of Scotia or Scotland during the 11th century. So we come to the end of what we identify as the Picts. Now, contrary to belief, the Picts did not disappear. They merged with the Scots to become the Scottish nation of Alba. The majority of people were Picts, with the elite positions mostly filled with Scots from Kenneth MacAlpin's previous court. Now, their language did disappear due to Christianisation, which had the Gaelic-speaking clergy spreading across Pictavia, so that became the dominant language. But the descendants of these Picts became Scots, and after several generations, their Pictish ancestry was just forgotten. But the people remained the same. And so looking back on the history of Scotland, we see a whole melting pot of cultures embroiled in feuds, alliances, and spiritual changes. This Cranach bag is a slice of that history, as the origins of the bag place it in Dalreda, and the carvings I have added come from Pictavia. It's a wee nod to the union between those two cultures, which form the foundation of the modern Scotland that we have today.